Good afternoon, this is Ed Salzberg and speaking for my sidekick Jimmy Baker who runs these webinar series with me. I welcome you to our GSA Schedule Bootcamp webinar series. It's a three-part series and we're doing this with a real expert in, in attaining and using GSA schedules to meet your revenue goal, Jennifer Schaus. And I'm going to introduce her just in one second. Jimmy Baker and I have been doing these for about two years now and Jimmy is the author of How to Win Business from the Federal Government. Um, it's really the best book around to understand where the money is and how to get yourself set up from a strategic standpoint to go after this marketplace. Whether you're new to the business or a seasoned company, um, that's a book you should always have by your side. It's not very expensive. Uh, Jamie Bratton is also going to be on with us talking about how you use his tool, which is uh, EasyGov Ops. It's a business intelligence tool within the GSA schedule program to identify opportunities that are coming up. Uh, that are being competed on the GSA schedules. I focus on capture and pipeline manager, but the real management, but the real person I want to identify today and introduce to you is Jennifer Schaus. She's president of Jennifer Schaus and Associates, and she focuses on GSA schedules, uh, whether you're an equipment manufacturer, uh, whether you provide services, whether you're an on-site um, manager of uh, facilities, the whole gamut of opportunities that are run through GSA schedules. Jennifer really understands how to how to get in front of those opportunities and put yourself in the best marketing position. We're doing a three-part series uh, with her. The first part, which is today's series, gives you a general overview of the schedule, uh, how to get it, how to use it, why to get it, uh, what, how to look at the return on investment so that you can make a really informed decision about moving forward. The second uh, session in this series is going to be next week, and uh, Jimmy Baker and Jennifer are going to be discussing uh, how to win business directly through that schedule, uh, how to research to get the right information, um, and then how to execute a, a program to get yourself in position uh, on your GSA schedule to be successful. And then finally, Jennifer and I are going to team up, team up and look at, looking, look at capture uh, in, in the context of GF, GSA schedules. And, and capture really is the same whether you're going after a large contract, a standalone vehicle, or task orders through GSA schedules, it's the timing that's different. And the urgency of some of the, the information gathering, uh, that's so important. And that, in a lot of ways, that's where EasyGov Ops comes in. Uh, today, we're going to cover what the GSA is, what the schedule is, and what it isn't, um, and especially focus on the return on investment. If there isn't a good return on investment, which you ought to know before you get into the schedule, uh, then you're kind of wasting your time going after a schedule. You really want to be looking at other ways of, of uh, accessing uh, this marketplace. I uh, should look at the current state of GSA schedules, how fast it takes to get them, um, um, and then um, what the competition looks like through them. And then next week, as I said, we've got, we've got the uh, second in the series, followed by the third one the following week. Uh, I want to thank the uh, sponsors, um, including the uh, speakers that are here, um, Jennifer's company, J. Um, Jennifer Schouts and Associates, EasyGov Ops, um, Jimmy's book, which he's going to give you an interesting offer at the end. Um, the book is not that expensive to begin with, but he makes it even cheaper. And also Set Aside Alert, which is an, a newsletter that focuses on uh, issues affecting small businesses and small disadvantaged businesses. Uh, and he does focus on identifying opportunities as well. Jimmy and I are also teaming up on a new series that we're calling Hunt, Capture, and Win. Uh, it's a paid series. We try to make this extremely inexpensive. And we're going to run two sessions. We're going to run a session on hunting and then a session on capturing and winning. And many of you who have been to our, our free webinars know that we talk about how, what, what it is you need to do in order to get yourself in front of the client and understand where the money is uh, and what to do or in what to do in order to position yourself to win. But we're going to, we're going to go from the what to the how and get hands-on in 90 minutes in each one of these sessions. So we'll have a workbook where you'll actually be practicing how to find the money and going through the OMB databases and um, setting up your pipeline in the second session so that you've got the analytics in place and actually making those calculations. The registration for the first session is open. Uh, the website is here. When you get the PDF, you can just click on that, or you can go to the ERS Advisors website and register right there. Uh, it's on October 16th, the second session. We haven't opened registration yet, but it will open on October 1st. And we'll also be putting a book together based on these two sessions. 
And if you're interested in that, you can email Jimmy at jamesjbaker.com to pre-register for that book. And it'll be ready shortly after these two series are done. So we'll be taking the workbook materials, the uh, training materials, all of the slides that we use, and packaging those up into a workbook. And with that, I want to turn this over to Jamie Bratton, who's going to explain how market intelligence fits into the uh, GSA schedule. So Jamie, you are on. Hey, thanks, Ed. Um, this is Mike. Jamie's on another call, but uh, hopefully um, we're going to fill in some of the gaps. Um, our, our tool can show you many of the schedules that are out there and um, um, also a broader picture into into the various um, other other contracts that uh, and opportunities that uh, that are in the marketplace for, for all federal contractors. So um, that said, I'll, I'll turn it back over to, to you, and um, hopefully Jim can catch up a little bit later and fill in the gap. Okay. You, you still want us to move ahead, and we'll come back to that. Yeah, we'll come back to that. Okay. Thanks. Okay, Jennifer, I, I want to yeah. hear about the meat and potatoes of it all. <laughs> Sounds great. Thanks, Ed, for a uh, very kind introduction, and uh, I want to welcome everybody who's joined us today. Good afternoon, everybody on the East Coast, and uh, buongiorno to everybody on the uh, West Coast who's gotten up to join us. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is the GSA schedule and kind of get into the nitty-gritty of it. Um, I will start by giving you guys an overview. We'll dig into uh, some of the details so you can start making decisions on if this is something that is a good idea for your company or not, um, and really have some uh, strategic reasons on why you are either going to pull the trigger and, and make the move to get onto the schedule or not. It shouldn't just be something that you decide to do on a whim or because your neighbor told you it was a good idea. You should really have some kind of uh, some logic and some numbers behind that decision. Uh, and then I'll kind of wrap up with my own thoughts and conclusions, and then we'll take some Q&A at the end, uh, which I believe we've allotted some time for. Okay, so as we dig into the uh, the overview, uh, the GSA, um, GSA is the General Services Administration. They're, they're actually broken into two parts. One part is the Public Building Service, which is sometimes referred to as PBS, and GSA is basically, I think, the world's largest landlord, so they are maintaining and overseeing all of the government buildings. And then the other part of GSA is the schedules, uh, and the schedule is Basically, it's a contract vehicle. It's a way for the government to purchase from you. But the GSA schedule is just one of many contract vehicles. There's others that are out there that are either agency-specific or industry-specific. So NASA has a, uh, a contract vehicle called NASA Soup. Um, it's just that GSA is probably the best marketed uh, schedule that's out there. That's why most people know what it is, um, and a lot of times, jump on to getting onto the schedule without really understanding what they've signed up for. The, uh, the schedules are broken out by industry or products or services that you sell. So there's 39 different schedules. So I'll give you some examples. Schedule 70 is for IT products and services. Schedule 84 is for security and law enforcement. Uh, there's a schedule for financial, financial and business services. And there's a schedule for marketing services. And the list goes on. Within each of those schedules, uh, there's something called SINs, which stands for Special Item Numbers. And those special item numbers further identify what your product or service is. Uh, so for example, we'll use the Schedule 70 IT services. Um, there is a special item number 132-51, which falls under that schedule, and that's for professional IT services. So, as you're making these determinations, you would need to determine which schedule you fit on, but then also which special item numbers. Uh, in addition to that, the schedule is a five-year contract, and it has three five-year renewable periods beyond that. So if you exercise all of the options, your contract, in essence, would be a 20-year contract. And since it is a contract, you are signing up for specific terms and conditions. And one of those uh, requirements that GSA requires that you meet, it's not an option, is that you bring in $25,000 worth of sales for the first 24 months 
and then $25,000 every year after that. There are repercussions if you don't meet these terms and conditions. So if you don't meet that $25,000 sales quota through your schedule, GSA will come in and revoke your schedule. Now $25,000 doesn't sound like a lot, um, and most companies don't think that it is a lot, but the, uh, the fact is that right now about 60% of schedule holders do not meet that requirement. So we'll kind of get into that a little bit later. Uh, another one of the requirements is that you pay GSA 0.75% of your GSA scheduled sales. You've got to pay that every quarter and make a, an online payment to them. And even if you don't um, have any sales for a particular quarter, you still need to go in and report that. So just keep that in mind. And along with that, you would obviously then need a, an accounting system that's going to be compliant and help you decipher which of your sales are GSA schedule and which are not. So again, that's 0.75% of your GSA schedule sales only. Uh, moving on to the next slide. The GSA schedule, the whole impetus for this is so that the government can buy directly from you knowing that they're obtaining the best prices that you have. So pricing is going to be the main factor. And they're going to be looking for prices that are better than or equal to what they call your MFC, your most favorite customer pricing. So if you're selling widgets for $100 and you gave Xerox a discount and uh, gave them a price of $90 for your widgets, GSA wants that better than or equal to that $90 rate. Once you've established that pricing for GSA, maybe you give GSA a rate of $89 which is, again, better than your most favorite customer. Once you then have solicitation, or I'm sorry, RFPs to uh, respond to through the schedule, your GSA price is a price ceiling only. So you want to make sure that you've got some wiggle room to bid on contracts and dip below your GSA price. Again, these would be for GSA-specific RFPs. And the GSA customers, as I've noted there, are actually encouraged to ask for deeper discounts. So as you're negotiating with GSA, you want to keep that in mind. OK, GSA, what it is, what it's not, and just some, uh, some precautions. Um, what it is, it's certainly not for everybody. Um, only 7 to 10% of federal purchases take place through the schedule. Yes, that's a small percentage, but it's actually a, a high dollar amount. Um, so you want to make sure that you've done that upfront research, as well as talking to your prospects and understanding how they purchase, do they use the schedule, uh, are they using maybe another schedule, uh, you know, what is their focus and, and how do they purchase. Again, the, uh, the schedule is a marketing or sales tool only, doesn't guarantee any sales, and you still have to meet this $25,000 per year quota. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, 60% of the schedule holders are not meeting that requirement, which means that if they have spent either their own time and money to get onto the schedule, uh, or they've hired a consultant, uh, and they haven't met that $25,000 threshold, GSA is going to revoke their schedule. So this really needs to be a, a business decision. Uh, we mentioned the IFF reporting. Uh, in addition to that, GSA also conducts audits. Um, they don't call them audits. They call them customer-assisted visits. Uh, and because this is a world of acronyms, they call those CABs. Uh, the auditor comes in on site to your facility and will sit down for, I would say, at a minimum, the audits that I've been in, the shortest one is probably four hours. The longest is probably about six and a half. And they will dig through your invoices, commercial and, and government, to make sure that you're paying GSA and to make sure that you've got all the compliance paperwork and basically that you're abiding by all the terms and conditions that you've signed up for. So there is obviously contract administration that goes in with this. Your basis of award pricing, um, and we can kind of uh, casually substitute most favorite customer here for basis of award pricing. There are implications post-award. So again, obviously companies are in business to make money, and you're making money by having profit and margin. So you want to make sure that when you're signing up for this, that you're not going to have uh, any implications afterwards. And this slide here uh, is going to give us an example. 
So again, we talked about your commercial price is $100 for the widget, whether it's $100 an hour or $100 for the, the product or widget. Your most favorite customer or your basis of award uh, customer, maybe that Xerox is giving a rate of $95. So your MFC is getting a 5% discount. You then offer GSA a 10% discount. You've got your schedule. You're out there hunting for business. And back in the commercial world, uh, you then are sitting down talking to Xerox. And they said, hey, um, you know, times are tough. How about you give us a rate of $85 for these widgets? You're then required to call GSA and let them know that your most favorite customer is now getting an even deeper discount. And what that means is you're then going to have to adjust your GSA price by that same percentage. So these are things to keep in mind before you sign on that dotted line. Uh, this slide, first I want to thank Ed uh, Salzberg for providing the picture of his muscle here for us. Um, but the, uh, the schedule is it's a feather in your cap. It's simply uh, a hunting license. You still really have to get out there and, uh, and hunt down your clients that potentially are going to be purchasing from the schedule. But it does show, if you've got that GSA logo you know, at a trade show set up there on your booth, you've got it on your business cards, you've got it in your email signature, and you've got it on your website, um, it does show that you are serious. It does give you an advantage. And probably one of the most important parts of the GSA schedule is that you're going to make the contracting officer's life a lot easier. This will minimize the paperwork uh, for them to process your order, for their order, I'm sorry. So all of the vetting has been done on the front end. Um, you've basically proven that you are giving GSA your best prices. And so it makes the uh, that procurement officer's uh, job a lot easier. In addition to that, you will receive uh, GSA eBuy notifications. And those are sent to you um, via push technology. It just comes out in an email. Sometimes it's once a day. Uh, sometimes it's once a week, once a month. It just depends on who within the government is trying to purchase your services. And those GSA eBuy emails come to you based on your schedule and your special item number. So if you're an IT service provider and your special item number is the 132-51, you're providing professional services, and we'll say maybe cybersecurity, you're going to be receiving uh, RFPs that you can respond to. Usually those have a um, fairly quick turnaround. So if you receive something on Monday, you may have to respond by Wednesday. There's no penalty or any repercussions if you don't respond to those. But um, hopefully it would be in your best interest to do so. And it also gives you some intel, because then you'll have a contracting officer's name, phone number, and email address. And I'm sure that's probably not the only RFP that they're, uh, they're working on. So that could be some all and potentially sit down with. Uh, GSAadvantage.gov is the online, um, I'll call it Amazon or eBay.com uh, website for the buyers to go on and find your products or services. So you get kind of free publicity there. Uh, additionally, there are some special item numbers. And I'll give you two as an example uh, that are dedicated to small businesses. Under the AIMS schedule, which is Schedule 5, and AIMS stands for Advertising and Integrated Marketing Services. So special item number 541-3 is for web design, and 541-4F is for graphic design. Those are set aside just for small businesses. So if there's a large company out there um, that wants to provide web design services to the government, uh, they're not going to be allowed to pursue those special item numbers. So that could be something to think about as you're uh, uh, planning to strategically target uh, government agencies. Another advantage to the schedule is that it does open you up to some state and local uh, government purchases. Two schedules, Schedule 70, the IT services, and Schedule 84, which is security and law enforcement, are both open to all state and local governments. Uh, basically what that's called is cooperative purchasing. And that was something that President Bush signed into law shortly after 9-11. Um, now, there are also some quasi-government uh, agencies, the UN, the Red Cross, and recently added was Habitat for Humanity and some other organizations that do have the ability to, uh, to purchase from the schedule. Just because they have the ability does not mean that uh, 
that they that the buyer actually even knows that. Sometimes it's an education process on your part. Um, and states also have their own contract vehicle, so they're not going to be required to purchase from the schedule. It's just an option. Okay, so as you start to think about, you know, is this something that I need? You know, what are the risks? What are the rewards? Is it really going to be worth it? Um, there's certainly, obviously, the, the big factors there, time and money. Um, as far as timelines, you're probably looking at um, if somebody is really dedicated and uh, doesn't have any other distractions or is not maybe running their business, you could probably get the proposal put together in about a month to two months. Um, on average, it usually does take, and this is just a, a realistic uh, estimate, you know, between one and four months. Once you submit your proposal to GSA, depending upon the schedule you're pursuing, uh, you're looking at a six to 16 month wait time for GSA to review your proposal. Um, that's a little bit absurd, but they're just backed up and inundated because the, uh, the B2B economy has not really recovered, and so many companies are now deciding to sell to the government and just jumping in to the GSA schedule. Uh, once you submit your proposal to GSA and you've satisfied any of their questions or what they call clarifications, you're then probably looking at a one to two month uh, estimate, I would say, for um, negotiating more on the price and filling out the paperwork, the final proposal revision, which just basically said that you agreed to everything that uh, the GSA laid out during the price negotiations, and then you are receiving your award. From there, the clock is ticking, and you better start hunting, or hopefully you've done that before, to, uh, to start to find customers. As far as what does it cost you, it doesn't cost you anything to download the uh, solicitation from the GSA.gov website. Uh, it certainly costs you your time and money, but two things that are required for the schedule, which do cost money. Uh, you've got to get a digital certificate and also an open ratings past performance evaluation report. Those are both around $200. The digital certificate is good for 24 months, and the, the open ratings report is good for 12 months. If your open ratings report expires before you're ready to submit, you need to obtain a new open ratings report. And then here are some other considerations. You should at least have a part-time or full-time salesperson that's just hunting for government business and specifically GSA. You've got contract administration to uh, be concerned with as well as in-house reporting and making those payments. Um, and then just a consideration, is it something you want to do in-house and fill out the proposal yourself or perhaps hire a consultant? So I just laid out some questions that uh, you should really consider before you uh, move forward. Make sure you read the solicitation. Uh, if you did decide to go through with the process, it's a contract that you're signing. So most people typically uh, find it valuable to read a contract before you put your name and uh, integrity there on the line. So know what you're, uh, you're signing up for. Make sure you've got some customers as well who are going to purchase from you from the schedule. Make sure you can meet the terms and conditions, including obviously the sales quota, and uh, that you can maintain and be a uh, compliant GSA vendor. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you've got you know 20,000 companies that are on the schedule, more or less, and a lot of them are not uh, meeting that sales quota. So as you start to do the research and, and really dig into who's on the schedule, are my competitors on there? Um, you know, what's the, the dollar amount that of, of GSA schedule contracts that's going to be available to me? For companies that are more or less, you know, my size, same industry, and maybe you guys, maybe you have an 8A certification or you're woman-owned, look at the other companies that kind of fall within your same demographics and see what's really available for you. Um, also, you want to make sure you meet the requirements. If you haven't been in business for two years, if your financials are a little shaky or you don't have invoices to justify your pricing, uh, it's not worth going through the ex exercise and headache and, uh, and gray hair to, um, to get through the process. Um, you also want to make sure you know how to use the schedule, and um, Ed and Jimmy will get into this later as far as, you know, now you've got it, how can you use it to your advantage? How can you start to drive business through your, your schedule? So we'll tackle those topics uh, next Thursday and the following Thursday. And also very important, you know, are you going to be able to make money from the schedule? On the flip side, you want to understand what's the 
the ROI, but what's also, you know, what is the cost of perhaps not having a schedule? Am I missing opportunities? You know, are there RFPs out there that I can't respond to or I can't help my customer because I'm not on the schedule? So make sure that you're not uh, uh, excluding yourself from, from opportunities. So the current state, what's happening at GSA? Uh, obviously, they're inundated and overloaded. Um, you know, if you haven't dotted your I's or crossed your T's in your proposal, your proposal is going to be rejected, and then it's basically to the back of the line. Um, you saw the wait time, six to 16 months, for them to even review your proposal. Um, the contracting officers, their priority is to focus on current customers who are making price changes, product additions, service additions, adding new special item numbers. Um, so new companies trying to get onto the schedule are not going to be uh, a priority. Two other things happening over at GSA. They've got a new schedule out, OASIS. OASIS is a combination of a couple of different, I'll call it, schedules. Um, OASIS stands for uh, One Acquisition Solution. Uh, of integrated solutions. So this is going to include program management, logistics, engineering, and financial services. So instead of getting three different schedules, OASIS is seeking to kind of combine all of those in one bucket. Uh, another thing which is, I think, very bad and uh, damaging news for small businesses is the FSSI. Um, and basically, what GSA is doing is saying, looking at a couple of different schedules. One is the janitorial and sanitation products, and the other is um, office products and maintenance and repair. They're saying, oh, looks like we've got enough um, vendors on these schedules. We're going to close the schedule. We're not taking any more new submissions. So uh, I've been to some hearings on that, and uh, obviously the small business community is not very happy because uh, if you fall into one of those categories and your customer says, hey, I need to buy your services through the schedule, well, you're out of luck. You can't get on. Okay, conclusions and, uh, and next steps. Again, the, uh, the schedule is simply a feather in your cap. Um, you still need to go out there and, and find the customers. It's not for everybody, and be sure that you do make this a business decision. Put down some numbers. Have a B2G business plan in place. And if you don't, then uh, I think it's uh, somewhat foolish. You can do some research on the GSA website. It's, uh, well, I would call it their research website, ssq.gsa.gov. It's the schedule sales query. And you can go in there and look at different vendors and what the schedule totals are and special item number total totals are. GSA on their website, they've got a little learning center. and I would say it's certainly in your best interest to take the readiness assessment and the pathway to success. There are little training modules. It's not going to be a waste of your time because you'll get some good intel out of taking those, and they're also required. There are two documents that are required for getting onto the schedule. Um, I can't emphasize enough that you really do need to talk to customers and find out how they purchase. Uh, what else? Okay, that one we're good. And I think that uh, pretty much wraps up my piece of today's presentation. So, Ed, I will hand everything back over to you. And I think Ed should be uh, joining us, or perhaps Jamie or, uh, about that. or Jimmy. I, I actually muted myself. Uh, I think I was waxing brilliantly there for just a minute. But Jennifer, one thing I appreciate about what you do is you caution people about the GSA schedule, even though this is your business and that's how you make money. Um, you caution people that you really do have to have a plan before you get into it. Otherwise, you're going to be extremely disappointed uh, with, with the schedule. It takes time, it takes effort, and uh, you may not get a return on that investment. So okay. the real, yeah. question, real question is, how do, you, how do you use it effectively and when is that when is it effective? And I'm going to ask you that question as soon as we hear from Jamie um, about business intelligence and getting the, the basic information about when these opportunities are coming out. Thank you, Ed. I appreciate that. And uh, what I wanted to talk to, to everybody about, specifically, you know, obviously, you know, being the, the topic of discussion, GSA, GSA schedule, why should you actually get on a GSA schedule? You know, dealing with market intelligence, it's uh, 
it's a whole new enlightening, you know, enlightening experience because GSA is a, is a specialized um, entity that, uh, you know, you have specialized GWACs, you've got 8A STARS is one of the actual you know, special programs, you have VETS, you have all these different uh, programs set up within GSA as a helping hand mechanism that, uh, you know, specific agencies and, and their core mission, uh, you know, obviously to, to help out, you know, businesses win contracts. A lot of these vehicles are available with, uh, with relative ease through the GSA C. So the GSA has obviously taken extreme advantage of that to, to again, you know, broaden the range of availability for, for winning contracts and just getting people on board you know, through these actual GWACs that are, that are available to, to the masses. And uh, it's, it's become you know, extremely advantageous, like for example the 8A STARS program, you know, to, to be extremely enticing for 8A entities to, to, to win you know, quite a few contracts. So again, people should definitely take advantage of that. Um, obviously, there's a cost involved, and Jennifer you know, touched upon this a, a little bit uh, in her, her overview uh, to get on the GSA schedule because, you know, again, it, it's a preferential you know, means to, to win contracts. And again, it's an extremely advantageous uh, venue for government agency personnel to make sure that you know, it gives them another avenue to, to focus on, I want to give this person a contract. Let's go through GSA and the specialized GWACs to do so. So where they couldn't have the availability or the ease of doing business with that special um, contractor that uh, they know that's qualified, they can find other means to be able to do so. So I just want to shed a little bit of light on that. Um, moving forward into to market intelligence, you know, how does market intelligence really uh, apply? And uh, Ed, if you can go to the next slide, please. What I did is Basically, I, I grabbed, and it's very difficult to, to, as you can imagine, doing a webinar, you know, with with a live tool, which is what market intelligence is. I captured a couple of screenshots, and market intelligence tools, you know, obviously give you and provide you an overview, a very, uh, very extensive overview of what that particular, if it's a GWAC or a program, that, uh, you know, in a sense of what is involved, you know, sense of the availabilities, you know, you know, who can qualify, you know, basically all the parameters are in place for that particular program. Uh, and, and this is just a, a small, you know, overview. But again, taking that overview, one, seeing if you qualify, um, two, to, to, to make sure that you, you know, basically know what the means are that are available to you to, to get on the, the GSA schedule um, and be a part of any other programs, you know, funded uh, vehicles that are out there as well. You know, you want to make sure you do your due diligence about whatever program or whatever special entity that you want to be involved with. So in market intelligence, you know, the whole purpose of market intelligence is specifically to make data talk. Uh, Ed, if you can go to the next slide, please. Now this, you know, again, is a continuation, again, just as an overview of some of the parameters. You know, 8A STARS, for example, is a great example. Uh, they have all these different varying levels of what they call functional error, you know, areas, and they're all predicated on different NAICS codes of, of expertise. And again, you've got to find out, quite simply, if you qualify for that specific program. So. Again, market intelligence tools give you that you know, great overview. Now, Ed, can you go to the next slide, please? Now, what I've done here, and, and this is a great example, I, I've taken the overview, and, and it's kind of in the backdrop here, and I put a little PDF call out. Uh, in the right, within our tool, um, and this is completely dynamic, and, and what I mean by dynamic is, is that every time a new 8A um, contract holder, uh, of 8A stars, that is, you know, in this particular example, they win a contract, if you look down to kind of the lower right-hand corner of your screenshot, it'll list all the contract holders, and there's a little parens area that uh, will have a number within that parens, and that's dynamic. That number, for example, if you look at uh, Synergetics uh, Incorporated, there's a little number three within the, the parens. That number may be four tomorrow. It may be nine by Friday. It may be 12 by the following Tuesday. And if you're doing market intelligence or companies that you want to find out how many contracts they are winning, Quite simply, this is a quick you know, kind of map to be able to do so. Now, you have the availability to actually be able to click on this particular company. You know, uh, within our tool, everything in blue is, is actually hyperlinked. And I believe the next screenshot actually uh, goes to the next level. So, Ed, if you can go to the next you know, screenshot, please. Now, this is a, um, you know, literally an entry where I clicked on the actual hyperlink, and it gives you a quick company overview about that specific company. It gives you you know, all the NACE codes, you know, the government, what we call POCs, uh, you know, as part of this uh, composite snapshot, how many employees, the DMV number, revenue, and so forth. And it also will actually go to another level, and this is very important. 
market intelligence can provide this for you and you only as a composite shot. Um, Ed, if you can go to the next slide, please. Now this next slide actually does a highlight of every contract that this particular company, Synergetics, has won and it basically gives you line item by line item. Again, everything in blue is hyperlinked that you can click on this and actually get a, a composite snapshot physically of that one contract and see everything that involved with that specific contract. So the beauty about this is it gives you a composite snapshot of 14 years historical data. So you're not just uh, you're getting a small snippet of uh, you know, visual uh, aid as to you know, what is entailed with this particular um, company, but again, you see every contract every sense of focus this company is obviously involved with in the, in the federal space. And uh, Ed, if you can go to the next slide. Now before I uh, do my salutations, I wanted to uh, also share a uh, little bit of uh, news about the, the GSA, you know, GSA scene and, and uh, you know, how and, you know, advantageous it is to a government contractor. Uh, I'm, I'm a little privy to a little inside information in the sense of the government's uh, vision uh, through multiple sources that has shared this with me. The next 10 years, you know, obviously we all know that GSA, uh, you know, getting on the schedule costs money. You know, it's a lot more of an expensive venture to, to get on the schedule as opposed to just being a, uh, you know, beginning stage government contract. You don't have any certifications and, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, you, you have some good, you know, stroke of, you know, good fortune to, to win contracts. But the GSA schedule actually is more of a helping hand. And again, it, it, it costs, you know, to, to do so, to, to be part of that privileged few of that particular, you know, GWAC or specific program. But what's happening is, is that, you know, as everybody knows, with sequestration, you know, with obviously with uh, no hiring, obviously with a lot of government agencies, um, with obviously all the contracting specialists being overloaded with workflow, you know, these agencies are looking for better means to handle their business. You know, obviously still do their due diligence to find the qualified government contractors, but they're finding the ease of doing business with GSA being tremendously easier. So what's happening is, is that GSA is getting a stronger um, you know, foothold of the government contracting awarding scene. And the vision is within the next 10 years for them to actually take over 80%, and I'm, I'm going to repeat that number again, 80% of all contract awarded dollars. That is their vision. That is what is in their roadmap. So taking everything that we shared today, obviously what Jennifer has shared and obviously what uh, Jimmy and Ed are, are going to sh you know, shed some great light on, you know, that is extremely advantageous to, to obviously you know, be part of that particular scene if that slice of the pie is increasing dramatically. So I just wanted to you know, make sure everybody was aware of that as participating in this, this webinar. That's extremely critical for you as a, as a government contractor. So I just want to thank everybody for their time, and uh, I'll turn it over to you, Ed. Thank you, Jamie. And that's actually startling news that the GSA thinks they're going to be able to be that successful. Uh, it makes the the year. It, it is amazing. It, it, it was a staggering figure. When I heard that, I thought it was a, a, a misquote or a misprint, but I actually validated with multiple sources. You know, I don't know if that's going to be achieved, but you know, like I said, that is their vision, and it's quite simply because of the ease of doing business, and GSA actually thinks outside the box with a lot of these programs that they come into place, and they really do have a, a really strong vision, and they have the means to be able to accomplish it, which is even better. Well, you know, and I think, too, if you think back to everyone on the phone, um, I came into this business during the Clinton-Gore administration where you were starting to see these large contracting houses get disbanded. And the idea of the government was looking for easier ways to buy things. So we, you know, we had lots of activity of GSA schedules, lots of activity of GWACs. When I was a, and forgive me, folks, this is a Jimmy Baker talking, when I was a uh, director of business development for a startup 8A, it wasn't a question of um, if, if we needed a GSA schedule, it was how quickly could we get it, because what it allowed us an opportunity to do is if I could go and find a problem to fix, a problem to solve, my favorite line from a government customer is, well, how, what's the easiest way I can get to you? I don't want to go out and do a full open procurement. I don't want to be with... Uh, tons and tons of other people. I want to streamline things. And so, you know, vital as you all are looking at this is, you know, my opinion is that it's, it's a necessity to have. I know there's some cases where it makes sense for an organization to have an arm's length distance from the government and you can use other people's schedules, but it's something that you should definitely take seriously. And, you know, even with Jamie's information, let's say they're half right and it's not 80% because that's still significant enough 
where you need to take the, these kinds of comments seriously and move forward with the GSA schedule. And as you've heard, Jennifer is, uh, uh, does this all the time for people and helps them get started. Um, let me move into some questions from the audience. Uh, I did see one question that I was not speaking loudly enough, so I'll try to, uh, I'll try to talk a little bit louder. Uh, in, in the question box, if any of you have questions that you'd like to put, uh, offer up to the panel members, please uh, just write them right in there. Um, here's one question. If you offer the client a cheaper price um, than what you have on the schedule, shouldn't the order be an open market order and thus competitive? Let's see, I th Jennifer, can you interpret that, or do you? Can you reread that, or? Um, let's see, if you offer the client a cheaper price than what you have on the schedule, shouldn't that order be an open market order, um, thus competitive? It is uh, going to be competitive. I'm not sure who they're referring to as client. Are they talking a government entity? Are they talking a GSA schedule purchase? Are they talking commercial? Um, maybe if they want to email that offline, we can answer that or, or retype the question. Um, yeah, if you could, um, and this is from P. Folch. If you Folch, if you could just clarify that a little bit, that would uh, that would be helpful to us. And a bunch. Let's see. Will the will the presentations be available yet later? Yes, they will. The uh, slides, and also we'll get a recording up um, for you. Um, a, a quick question about what do you do if you don't have a schedule, Jennifer? Is it possible to get to use another company schedule? Uh, there are certainly opportunities for joint venturing and partnering. Um, I would preface that by uh, make sure you know that you're getting into bed with. Um, and I would say at that point, even on a, a low budget, I would say spend the money, hire a, uh, a government contract attorney to make sure that Again, that you know what you're signing up for, that you know who you're you're partnering with, and yeah, there are certainly options to do that. Um, um, so I would uh, I would say, you know, if you're first starting out, that that could be uh, ways to first explore the market and, and let someone else take a little bit more of the risk. Um, but uh, they'll probably be negotiating. Whoever that company is that's got the schedule, they're going to be negotiating with you pretty seriously as well on price. So. Um, and Jennifer, um, is it better to go after a GSA schedule um, before you have your 8A certification, or would would you should you wait to get that first if you are eligible for it? It's a great question, and we get that uh, that question a lot. And as we speak to potential customers, a lot of times once they really understand uh, all the terms and conditions of the GSA schedule. And we learn that uh, that they would qualify for the 8A certification. Sometimes the 8A is going to give you more traction, um, but again, this is never going to be a cookie cutter answer for every company. Um, it really is going to be based on, you know, if you kind of back into this, who is your client, how do they buy, um, you know, what are your competitive advantages. And yeah, if, if the customer can check a box that says, I'm awarding this contract to an 8A, uh, and a company also has a GSA schedule, you know, that's two bonus points there for you. So um, both can certainly be advantageous. It's not that you need one to have the other. Um, sometimes, you know, companies do fine with the 8A, but keep in mind with the 8A, that's just a nine-year contract, and then once you graduate, you're done. So you really need to have a, a very, very aggressive business plan on kind of what happens next after the 8A, where the GSA schedule is a 20-year contract if you exercise all of your options. Um, but again, just base it on your business plan and, and where your, your ROI is going to be. And I don't have that answer. Your customers do. Jennifer, could you shed some light on how the government makes a decision whether to use the GSA schedule or issue a contract themselves? Is there some requirement that certain agencies have to use the schedule? Uh, some have a, a higher propensity to, to use it. Some like it, some don't. Um, and again, a lot of times it does come down to the, uh, to the buyer um, and really what their preference is. Now, one way that you can use the schedule is if you have it and you're in there talking 
you know, in a meeting with your prospect uh, within the government agency, and you say, hey, we've got these great gizmos, and they want to buy your gizmos, but maybe you've got two or three other competitors that have something similar, and they are not on the schedule, meaning your competitors are not, but you are, um, you can help kind of steer that RFP and, and make that be a, a GSA schedule purchase. Um, and basically, you've got to sell it. It's a marketing tool. So uh, talking to your buyer, um, sometimes it may just be a, you know, a quick conversation of, you know, will this help eliminate a lot of the paperwork for the contracting officer? It will be a, a quick and easy buy and, and do it that way. So it certainly is a way to keep out uh, competition and, and make it easier for the government to purchase from you. Jennifer, talk for a moment on what exactly is the competition, because I want to make sure we, we have that clear for folks. If, if I give GSA pricing to a government person, what are they obligated to do? Do they have to go out and get two other people? Is it five? Is it four? How do they determine what is the best value for them? Uh, if you're giving uh, your customer GSA schedule pricing, uh, depending upon how much they're going to be purchasing, there's going to be uh, dollar thresholds where they would potentially have to go out and obtain additional quotations. Is there a threshold number? Is it because th I hear three competitive bids in order for a procurement to go forward? Is that true with with GSA schedules, or not always true? Uh, above one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, yes. And I will double check on that. But uh... and Jamie, there's a question about the statistic that you use, the eighty percent. So I just want to reiterate that that's really what you had heard that the GSA thinks it's going to capture eighty percent of the contracting business in the next several years. That is correct. And like I said, I validated with the three sources, and that's really high up with actually the first source that told me, um, really high up within GSA as to their vision. And like I said, whether or not that gets accomplished or not, that's a whole different ball of wax. But the bottom line is, is that you know they're trying to do federal mandates that you know that percentage is achieved, you know, in the, within the next two, you know, ten years or at least targeted. And like I said, that's a mammoth task. But you know, like I said, you know, the government's trying to do, you know. They're trying to change the methods of how they operate it. Quite frankly, like I say, with, with hiring freezes, you know, you, know, none the, you know, none of the main government agencies are doing any kind of hiring mechanisms right now. You know, they're trying to get some of the older workforce to actually, to in fact, retire. And they're trying to you know, create better methods for the actual awarding the contracts to make sure that those same folks that are, uh, you know, especially small business, because nobody's meeting their you know, set, you know, set aside you know, goals, that uh, these special programs on a broad scale, you know, where GSA has that, you know, unique advantage, can create these programs on a much, much bigger, you know, scale that uh, it's extremely advantageous for business. Jennifer, there's a question about IFF reporting. I think it's just a clarification. Would you just explain that one more time? Sure. So the industrial funding fee, which is the IFF, is a payment to GSA every quarter only the 0.75% of your GSA schedule sales. So this has nothing to do with your commercial sales or, uh, or government sales that aren't through the GSA schedule. It's just your GSA schedule sales. I also wanted to make a, a quick note, especially for the services companies. Don't think that just because you've got a GSA schedule and if there's there's an RFP that comes uh, out under the GSA schedule that you're not going to have to uh, to write any sort of um, uh, proposal uh, because those are, you know, there's still writing that's involved. There's ample writing that's required to get onto the schedule, um, but even post award, you're still going to have uh, to to write some narratives and uh, executive summaries and that sort of thing. So it doesn't exempt you from that. Right. Okay. Um, that was the last actual question, but, but I have a couple of questions of my own. Um, first of all, Jamie, one for you. You had put up the, um, the, the history of the, of the, of the procurement, um, and so my question is, well, how do you use that information? Uh, so, good question, Ed. How do you utilize the information? Basically, you take, um, let's say, for example, the, the one example that I posed was the 8A STARS-2 program. Uh, which is a GWAC program by GSA, you take that data that is actually available to you. You know, one, you know who the actual contract uh, holders, you know, who, who are winning these specific contracts. Um, within that specific program, you know, there's certain allocated NAX codes, so obviously, for, for available. 
um, you know, participation from obviously qualified you know, entries. But again, you can monitor who's actually participating, see if any new players are in, in the space as contract holders. You, know, you can use the market intelligence in, in a unique angle in that specific, you know, specific scheme of things. Now, it's a different realm outside GSA. You know, I mean, you have a little bit more you know, latitude with Intel because you're not set within a certain program. You, you, you have a little bit more competitive uh, you know, advantage using market intelligence outside GSA in some venues. But uh, to, to answer your question, you know, let you know who the players are, let you know what contracts they're actually winning within that same specific GWAC. And like I say, you know where that company's vision is in a sense of, you know, there's, you know the, the, the total scope of what you're trying to focus on. So hopefully that answers your question. And also speaking as a capture manager or I advise on capture management, here's another way to use that information too. You can track the history of a, of a particular piece of business uh, it could be historically going through a GSA schedule, but you can identify that piece of work and who's won it. Sometimes the same firm wins it over and over again. That sort of tells you something about the strength of the incumbent. But sometimes the agency changes maybe every time that procurement goes out, uh, which, is, which means it's just a much more competitive piece of business. That kind of intelligence is really important as you decide whether or not to go after that, that unit of work or not. Ed, you're absolutely right. That uh, that uh, history trail, you know, knowing that that particular opportunity may have come out in a whole different uh, you know, light or a different means initially, and then because of the ease of business, may have gone uh, you know, the particular 8A you know, stars route, for example, in that that particular you know, case point example I showed, that um, you know because of the ease of business, you know, went that particular route, and then maybe later down the line, it may recycle back to the original venue, mm -hmm. you know, from the agency itself, you know. You know, directing that, sole sourcing it, or what have you. So, you absolutely can see the historical trail uh, from beginning to you know to the eventuality of you know that being released again in another method. And also drilling into that into the data itself, you'll have the old RFP in there. And what's interesting about lining up the scope of work or the way they 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 or the evaluation criteria, but especially the scope of work. If anything changes in the scope of work, if the mission is changing for an agency, that becomes an opportunity. For, uh, for new contractors to come in. Anything that's changing from the status quo uh, becomes a, an, a potential opportunity for new contractors to come in. So I always like to look at the changing in the scope of work and also get some idea of whether the, the work that the current contractor is doing now um, is different from the way the RFP is, is, is uh, constructed for the, uh, for the subsequent contract. So all of these little bits and pieces of information sort of come in to, to, let, to make you understand or to enable you to understand the competitive landscape so that you can navigate that landscape and, and, and get to the head of the competition. Speaking of uh, changing, one thing to note is that the GSA schedules are an open and rolling RFP um, with obviously making multiple awards to multiple companies. Every schedule has something on it kind of a time and date stamp that they call a refresh number. So if you're downloading the solicitation uh, for Schedule 70 and it says refresh number 21 and so you fill out all your paperwork and three, four, five, six months later you submit your proposal to GSA and you haven't gone back to the solicitation on the GSA website and perhaps they've moved on to the next refresh, meaning that they've updated some terms and conditions in the solicitation they will reject your proposal. So you want to make sure that you uh, certainly keep an eye on that refresh number and that it has an advance to the next one because you're basically, re you would then be replying to a, uh, an out of date or obsolete RFP. And I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, today um, for our discussion on GSA schedules. Uh, if you have any individual questions, feel free to address them to any of the, uh, the speakers. As far as our giveaway, um, we are giving a free ticket to our next Kennedy Center Government Contractors Networking event. We typically pull in between 200 and 250 government contractors. Um, and what I decided to do was take, uh, since today is the 12th, we'll take the 12th registrant from, uh, from today's webinar. And if there's someone in the D.C. local area, this would be great. If they're not, we'll go ahead and mail a uh, Starbucks gift card for that same dollar amount.
This is a great event for contractors, government people, and um, just industry folks uh, for networking with people um, in the area. And from from Jamie Bratton, EasyGov Ops, which is which is just such a great tool. Um, I, I think if you didn't discount it, and it's not that expensive, it would be. A, uh, or if you didn't have a special offer, it's just a great tool. But Jamie, you want to talk about your offer? Absolutely. What uh, what uh, we're trying to offer all participants of uh, any actually webinar series. So obviously, take advantage of today's webinar series and and, and future ones as well. Is that uh, when you sign up for a free five day trial. If you just schedule a 30-minute one-on-one demo, we actually wear your hat as a government contractor. So we utilize your NACE codes, your agency of focus. We show you historical data, uh, forecasting information in the sense of uh, what the agency is actually going to release in whatever time frame that uh, uh, you duly need. So basically that information uh, will be, uh, you know, again, shared with you wearing your hat. Um, you get additional days, uh, 10 days free, obviously, by scheduling that and, and you know, obviously sharing your time, which you were most appreciative of. Uh, I have one of my sales reps, uh, Mike Neff's uh, email address is uh, this part of this PDF or this slide. So please, uh, obviously, take note of that and, and take advantage of You know, it's a five-day free. We don't ask for any credit card information or anything like that. Again, roll up your sleeves, dive into the tool, and uh, definitely partake in the, the educational uh, aspects of uh, the actual demo itself. We highly encourage that. Market intelligence is uh, an extremely complicated venture that we tried to make very simplistic. Again, uh, you know, just our site, just to give you an example, there's 8,000 web pages within our tool. It's just a mammoth amount of data. You know, again, we try to simplify it. So we welcome uh, anybody, obviously, to participate in this, and, uh, and we appreciate your time today. It's, it's hard to be competitive against firms that have a tool like this. Um, if you don't have it, um, I, I do. I, I love to train. I used to be a, a school teacher, and I pack just about everything I know into a business acquisition training video. Uh, much of what we do in the in these webinars comes out of that training program, and as part of the webinar special, uh, I'm just offering it for seventy nine dollars. It costs a lot more money than that, but you get the analytics, pipeline management, um, pretty much everything I've learned in the last thirty five years on how to set up and win uh, contracts. It tells you what to do overall. The, the session that Jimmy and I are going to be running that we are charging $49 for uh, will tell you not, not just what to do but how to do it. And we're going to do a much deeper dive into each one of these areas. So you'll come out of those sessions really well trained. But for $79, you'll get such a good view of the whole marketing, positioning, and winning landscape within the government uh, marketplace that this is a this is an excellent buy for whether whether you're 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 new to the business and you want to get the whole landscape the whole life cycle of, of marketing or if you're a seasoned pro you're still going to get a lot of tips and tools out of this thing that will just just really tighten up your business acquisition program uh, within your corporation and Jimmy tell me about your book listen I know a lot about your book but let's tell this group about it <laughs> folks uh, for listening in today um, I if you get a chance to order my book, my book is a, about a 130-page tactical guide that teaches you how to go from concept to actually getting on the phone, sending emails, creating a marketing program, going after the government. I spent a great deal of my life in sales and marketing. Um, you'll hear a lot of war stories from the trenches in the field and just tactical applications that you can do. Don't take my word for it. There are a lot of book reviews out there on Amazon, as well as the book's website, which is there on the screen. But what we're doing today, for anyone that attends the webinar, I'll do a 30, 45-minute strategy session with your team after you've had a chance to look through the book, and we can talk a little bit more about some of the concepts that are in there. If you have any other questions, my contact information is there at the bottom, my phone number and email, and I'd be happy to talk with you outside of this. And then next week when we come back to part two of the series, I'm going to be going into a little bit more detail on how you create a run rate. So you get a schedule and you got to start from somewhere and how you actually turn it into the first 25,000. So we'll be discussing that. Great. And then the second one we'll be talking about um, setting, up the, setting up the competition and how you become more competitive. Um, and actually win overall. Uh, I also want to mention Set Aside Alert, which does uh, help sponsor our events and get the word out. Uh, they um, offer a 12-month subscription to their entire newsletter for only $397. There's, this is so packed with information that um, 
you are so much more competitive if you understand what's happening within the government as it relates to small, small disadvantaged um, businesses. And let's see, you can sign up for our the next two the next sessions in our series at Jennifer's site and at publictechnologiesexchange.com. I don't have it up on the ERS advisor site yet, uh, but I do have the training that we're doing. Um, the, the two uh, workshops that Jimmy and I are running up on the website. So if you go to ersadvisors.com, you can click on the registration there and get over to the um, to, to that page. Well, I thank Jennifer for for explaining the GSA schedule. The, the expertise that she has is really valuable to everyone. Thank you, Jamie, for uh, talking about business intelligence in the GSA uh, context, um, and Jimmy for helping put this session on. And I thank the audience and. Um, Almost uh, 65, almost 60 people stayed right until the bitter end from over 100 that started. So um, I thank you for, for sticking on. If you, would, if you would just fill out the, the brief survey at the end of the session, uh, we would appreciate it if it uh, helps us uh, improve our webinars and come up with topics that maybe we hadn't thought about but you'd like us to address. So with that, I'm going to end the webinar, and thank you all for staying with us.